I come from the Open University in the UK. We educate um, adults uh, of all ages uh, in a distance education format. And um, we've been doing online learning for over 20 years, blended learning. A lot of our students attend face-to-face -face tutorials as well as studying from online and printed materials and other media. And of course, mobile learning it came into the picture um, about 15 years ago when we started our first experiments. So we have a lot of experience in, the, in these different media and um, when we think about mobile, uh, the application of mobile technologies, it's um, definitely going beyond the idea that you just access um, course content or, uh, or a discussion for on your mobile device. It's thinking about learning beyond the classroom. So in a way that's my theme for today, learning beyond the classroom. When we think about today's language learning and communication challenges, there are many new situations where learners can organize themselves using their personal technologies and learn in a more kind of self-directed way or learn with others collaboratively. And that's a very different scenario to even just a few years ago. And so, of course, we see mobile learning uh, making a big difference uh, across the world in environments where people perhaps in the past didn't have good access to education, didn't have access to more expensive desktop technologies, but they have mobile phones now. And, and so we see uh, the, uh, the devices making a big difference to people's lives in many situations. But also, as we look at those different scenarios and, and situations, we think about how does the content of what, the, of what we teach people need to change? How does, how does this technology affect our thinking about uh, what language is needed in these situations? Uh, what are the new communication challenges? So that's what I find most interesting in this area. The way that uh, the use of the technology makes us rethink what we do and how we do it. And getting students much more involved in the design of the learning activities. And really exploring their needs. You know, what are their immediately needs and their longer term needs? And how do they, from their perspective, how do they see things? These kinds of pictures can be unnerving for teachers because they don't show a teacher involved in these situations. And we might be asking ourselves, where is the teacher? So um, typically the teacher is there somewhere, uh, just not visible. So the teacher will perhaps have designed the activity or um, will have advised the learners of how they can design learning for themselves. Uh, they might be there as online, remote online facilitators advice givers, counsellors, all sorts of new roles for <coughs> teachers are evolving. Uh, so I think the teachers are still there, but they will be assuming new, they are starting to assume new roles, but they're, they're still very, very important. Before I go any further, I'd be really interested to know how many of you already use mobile technologies in some way uh, in your teaching, in your classrooms, or in your um, institutions, your organizations. How many of you are already into this? Okay, <coughs> about, I guess about half. So that's, that's good to hear. And I think a lot of people, when they perhaps don't know much about this field, they tend to think of uh, mobile learning as e-learning on a mobile device. And I hope that through this presentation, I will extend your kind of conception of what mobile learning is about or can be about. So I think one uh, really important uh, thing that's happening is that learning is being described in all sorts of new ways. So in these environments, what we can see is informal learning taking place. It's contextual. So we have all sorts of descriptors that are, are being used um, to, to reflect the kind of different types of learning taking place. I've um, assembled some of these descriptors on this slide. Um, so what types of learning are we talking about when we uh, analyze and design learning beyond the classroom? Well, as I said, it's, it's 
mobile, not in, only in the sense of use of mobile devices, but that the learners themselves are mobile and the content is mobile uh, and the ideas that they're drawing on are mobile. And it's informal, it's been described as serendipitous, um, incidental, experiential, rhizomatic, ubiquitous, all kinds of uh, terms. I'm not going to go into more detail at the moment, but I think it's important to kind of um, realize that it's, it's very, very different. It's very different. So how do we design for these kinds of learning opportunities? Um, it's a big challenge and one that we're working on uh, in, through all kinds of different projects. In relation to mobile language learning specifically and helping people with communication in daily life, uh, we've worked a lot with migrant learners. And in these projects, we have uh, looked at how we can design mobile learning experiences that support activities such as preparing for communication, practicing for uh, particular tasks that people need to perform. And uh, often this happens while they're traveling, so on the bus or on the train, maybe at times when they are um, standing in a, in, a, in a queue waiting for something. So uh, periods of free available time short periods of time but um, they can be quite regular uh, habits that people get into or they can be quite spontaneous opportunities to learn. We want to focus um, attention on how the environment um, that people are in is a resource for learning. So to encourage them to notice what's around them, so noticing, recording, capturing what's around them translating um, what's around them and checking if that translation is correct. So using things like signs and displays uh, and things that they hear. So there's a whole world of really a, a sort of, I suppose you could say a whole new world of where learners are um, active in creating content. So recording things, capturing images, making video recordings and sharing that with others to perhaps check their understanding. So making social contact is a big part of that. And uh, in some of our projects, uh, we've worked with um, volunteers who, for example, support migrants, and then others who play other roles like mentors or facilitators. And some of these projects have also tried to address the issue of social inclusion. So how can people learn the language, learn to communicate, and also get a sense of being more included in the new community uh, that they have, they have perhaps joined um, by um, living, you know, arriving in a new place, new city. There's also a, a strong element of playful learning in um, many of our explorations. So uh, it doesn't all have to be serious learning. It can be um, very beneficial for people to to um, engage in, in, in playing games and that, uh, the, the, if you think of the city as a learning environment, <coughs> offer, offers many opportunities for, uh, for game playing. And then also thinking about, okay, um, how are we going to support learners to take greater advantage of what's around them? So we could give them some recommendations, for example, places to visit in the city, new things to learn. And then we want to also ref encourage them to reflect on what they've uh, learned, what they've achieved, and what they might do next. What are they going to do tomorrow, the next week, the next month, and so on. So these are some of the key elements of the design, really, design for learning that, um, that we've, uh, we've been carrying out. I'd just like to pose, uh, pause for a moment um, and think about how we <coughs> define mobile learning. Mobile learning has been a subject of research and practice for a long time now, and the, the definitions have evolved. Uh, so starting with definitions that are very much focused on technology to uh, later phases where it was recognized that the mobility of learners was uh, m perhaps more important and that the role of context was important. So here we have two kind of different definitions that I've picked out that emphasize different aspects. The first one emphasizes the immediacy of learning. 
It's quick nature, so quick hands-on training, on-the-go learning, just-in-time performance support at the moment of need. So that's one conception. Um, and then the second one contrasts with that because it's saying that actually mobile learning is something that's sustained um, across settings or contexts. So it's learning across multiple contexts through interactions, so social interactions, content interactions, using personal uh, electronic devices. And that's a commonly um, adopted definition by Helen Crompton that was uh, published not so long ago. So there are these two, uh, I think, aspects to bear in mind, the, the immediate um, aspect of mobile learning and the ability to, to facilitate continuity over, an, over time and over different contexts and settings. So that might be the classroom and the home and people learning in a library and on the bus and with friends and, and so on. So different contexts, but the technology is the one constant that they take with them and that can potentially connect all these contexts. So that is something that we couldn't easily do with uh, previous technologies. So that is, I think, both aspects, I hope, emphasise what's different now um, and wh how mobile learning um, you know, brings new, new opportunities. Thinking about the nature of mobile learning, many people now, of course, like here, I carry around different kinds of devices and make use of them in personal ways, taking photographs, making notes, uh, um, sharing maybe on social media. Uh, so uh, it's, um, the, the technology is described as being ubiquitous, um, you know, it has pervaded societies, not, not everywhere across the, across the world, but, um, but in many countries that is the case. So in a sense, uh, mobile technologies and mobile learning are for all, you know, they're for everyone. But um, it is also true that uh, the way in which they're used is often for targeted groups and for targeted activities. So just for today, I wanted to emphasize these two aspects because this will lead me on to the, uh, the idea of personalization. So in terms of targeted groups, this is by no means a complete or comprehensive list. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, refugees and uh, migrants have been a, a, you know, a, a group that, that have benefited and I think can benefit hugely from mobile learning, particularly a chance to continue their education or perhaps to, uh, to um, you know, start some, some education. Uh, Unemployed young people, another group that has been uh, researched. Um, learners with disabilities or in impairments have been shown to benefit. And also has been a big push to support female learners in communities where they've not had um, access to education in the past and therefore suffer from low levels of literacy. So focusing on how mobile technologies can support uh, literacy development, uh, which really leads me on to the targeted activities. So literacy could be one of those activities. Often the idea is to support learners with particular difficulties that they have. So, and then and of course uh, aspects uh, within that, pronunciation or grammar, whatever it might be. Um, and then also activities like getting more benefit out of uh, more traditional uh, educational activities such as museum visits, visits to cultural heritage sites. That territory has been very well explored in mobile learning uh, projects. And then also performance support, so just-in-time support for a particular situation, uh, coaching and mentoring activities. So, um, as I say, although mobile learning is for everyone, um, it is also uh, can be used in particular ways, uh, and that really depends on understanding the learner, what their needs are, what their circumstances are, what they really need help with, and how they might benefit. Uh, I was invited to write a paper for Cambridge University Press on personalization of language learning through mobile technologies, and that will be available very soon. 
what I'm doing here is summarizing some of the ideas that contained in that paper and also some of the examples or case studies that, um, that I've included there, and, um, including uh, projects that we have uh, led uh, at the Open University. So what is personalization? It's generally understood as a teaching approach that takes account of learner differences and preferences, while also enabling learners, and this could be groups of learners, so not only individuals, to reach some goals, which might be predetermined goals or negotiated with the learners. So this really summarizes, I think, a lot of literature on personalization, um, much of which lacks focus and, um, and actually there's a, a lot of um, critique within the field of you know, the idea that personalization has not been well defined. It means many things to, to many different people. Um, what I uh, wanted to emphasize here is kind of um, difference between personalization and personal learning. So to me, um, personalization is an approach that can enable personal learning. And the way that I understand the difference here is that personalization is a, a word that reflects a teacher perspective. How can I personalize the learning experience for my learners? Personal learning, on the other hand, is, takes the learner's perspective. Learning is personal, so it's mine. How do, I, how do I learn effectively? And how can my teacher enable me to learn effectively? So these two things are complementary, but a little bit different. Um, but you know, if you read uh, anything in this field, you'll find that these, these terms are quite used in quite um, overlapping ways. But I think that distinction is a useful one to make. So we've been working on personalization for many years. We didn't necessarily call it personalization. We've use the term personal, personal learning on more occasions. And one of our early projects in terms of using mobile technologies for language learning was this one where we enabled our Open University students who are studying a language, so they're enrolled on a formal course, to obtain additional speaking and listening practice in their free time. Some of the existing learning uh, materials were adapted to be accessed on a mobile phone and uh, learners could, uh, could listen um, and respond on their phones. Their responses were recorded. Uh, they could listen to themselves, so play back what, they had, um, what, what their responses had been. And also the teacher could, could uh, listen to, to their responses on a website. So the information was also on the phone and also on a website. It was quite a small project, but um, proved to be very motivating for those who took part in it. So um, in 2009-10, when we, when we did this, not many of our students were using mobile phones for any purpose, really. And uh, to many of them, it was a revelation that they could learn a language using a mobile phone. And um, that continues to be the case. Even in 2016, we, we've done many surveys of our learners uh, asking them, are you using your phone to support your language learning? Some of them do, increasing numbers do. Um, and then there are many others for whom it's still a completely new thing. Those that do use their phones um, often uh, use uh, mobile apps that have been recommended by friends or that they happen to have found in, a, in an app store. Uh, and it's a bit hit and miss. Some, some of it's good, some of it's terrible. Uh, but there's a growing demand for this. People do want to supplement their learning with particular applications that they perceive help them. Now, it may be that their perceptions are correct and uh, you know, there's still a lot to be, f to be discovered about how people choose the resources that they feel they need, uh, whether they are helpful, 
and so on. So that's kind of another, another project uh, to, or to keep exploring that. But in this case, we delivered particular materials that people could use uh, to practice listening and speaking on their phones. So that's one project. A more recent one, also focusing on listening, has been a project um, that is called Audio News Trainer. It's, a, it's an app produced with some colleagues at UNED in Spain. What we did here is we made it easy for people to listen to news from around the world, offering uh, them three levels of difficulty, so green, orange and, and red. So we had two groups uh, tri trialling this. And in addition, one group um, had a Facebook page where they could post their uh, summaries of the news that they'd listened to and um, had the, uh, the ability to comment on other people's postings. So there was this social element. And that proved to be very effective for, for the group that used uh, Facebook in conjunction with the app. So here we've got the ability to improve your listening comprehension, choose the news that you want to listen to, choose your level of difficulty, have some practice in summarizing what you hear, get other people to comment on your summary. The teacher can be involved or not, depending on how you set this up. And again, it proved to be popular. So we haven't um, looked at whether you know, listening comprehension was actually improved. Um, and that's partly because the people taking, taking part in this were preparing to uh, register for um, university courses at UN UNED and they had all sorts of different backgrounds so there wasn't a kind of consistent um, level um, from which you could look at uh, level of improvement. So a bit difficult to, to do um, but could be used, uh, trialled in a different context and we could look at um, whether listening comprehension had improved. But that wasn't the main focus here. It was more about giving people choice, giving them, motivating them to listen more and making it easy. You can listen in all, you know, from, uh, on the internet uh, and you, you can listen, but this made it easy and kind of quite focused for them. Another interesting project, uh, again, is a mobile app developed by a doctoral student uh, at the University of Toronto. Uh, this is an adaptive mobile application. And the idea here is, again, to supplement language learning, give additional opportunities for practice, focusing on vocabulary learning. But this time, the idea is that some uh, content will be generated on demand uh, from internet-based resources. So this is a, quite a clever program that uh, over time responds to learner needs and desires in terms of vocabulary that they want to learn by drawing on existing internet-based resources and bringing those in, uh, into the app um, and allowing pe people to practice more and also to do things like tag um, vocabulary lists and, and work with them in different ways. Uh, so I think we'll see more of these kinds of adaptive uh, applications that uh, draw on um, existing resources. I would um, now like to tell you about yet another project, maybe in slightly more detail, which is the Mazeltov app. The Mazeltov project was a big European funded project that um, involved 15 partners. It finished last year uh, producing an app, which I'll tell you about in a moment. The idea here being that we wanted to offer mobile assistance to migrants and to enable social inclusion. So the basic premise was that migrants needed a lot of help uh, when they arrive in a new place. Uh, they need help with everyday activities like finding places and getting around, um, finding work and so on and they needed to learn the language. And so we wanted to help them with everything uh, at once. And this was a, a big challenge, really. So the first step was to run workshops with uh, many groups of migrants, identifying their motivations, their problems, their aspirations, and so on, and how they were already using te uh, mobile technologies, and um, what sort of concerns they had around the use of mobile technologies. 
um, what sort of um, expectations they had. And here it was clear they were concerned about costs, so cost of living, also cost of using technologies. And they wanted to improve their situation in terms of finding a job and so on. And their sense of confidence, that was very important. And they wanted to be able to trust the information and, the, and trust any people that, um, that were involved in helping them as well. So we did this kind of background work, discovering their needs, and also some uh, complementary work looking at what places people visited uh, in the city and where they might want to learn. So, for example, uh, there might be opportunities uh, during a visit to a hospital to learn about relevant um, terminology. Similarly, you know, at the, when they were waiting uh, for a train at the transport station and so on. So we identified these different places and uh, looked at whether uh, technology use was feasible and also socially acceptable in those different places. What we produced was one single app through which you could access all sorts of different tools and services. So you could access things like a social network, information, translation tool, uh, so on, and language learning. So a complex um, set of tools, but all accessed through one interface. So this is the interface to the app. So from this kind of dashboard, you can access all these different kinds of help, including language learning. So this this set of tools and services is context aware, which means that the phone, if you like, is, is aware of where you are in the city, uh, if, you, if you allow this. Um, and also you can say what your interests are and that, that combination of location and interest can give you some um, personal recommendations for learning. Just as we were completing that project, we also undertook another sort of related project called SALSA, Sensors and Apps for Languages in Smart Areas. The difference here being that the learner is walking through the city and as they approach a particular place or a building, something that, that's been identified as being potentially interesting or useful to them, something is triggered on their phone and that something could be a lesson, could be some content, could be an alert. In our case, we designed um, 12 scenarios and um, so, for example, one at the council offices. And so, as people um, visited the council offices, uh, there would be um, a trigger on their phone and they'd be able to access some, um, some, a language lesson uh, around um, language needed to interact um, at the council offices. So the way this was done, that small devices called beacons were placed in different places, in different locations around the city. And these beacons are low cost devices that can broadcast some content, some information. And when the, the, the learner is close to the beacon, that, that content is triggered. So we had a small scale experiment with 12 language lessons in different locations across Milton Keynes and also on electric buses. So students traveling by bus could access some content on the bus. All very experimental. Again, um, emphasis here on mo it was very much on motivating people to learn, getting them to access things more frequently perhaps than they would otherwise, um, maybe getting them to visit places that they wouldn't normally go to in the city, which raises interesting questions. And there are many pedagogical and policy considerations or, or implications from all this. I haven't had time today to go through the detail. Uh, you'll find much more in that, that publication that I mentioned. Here are just three considerations that I've picked out. I would say what's important in this conception of mobile learning is the emphasis on authentic language challenges, identification of learners' emergent needs, whether that be individually or in groups, and 
also developing and sustaining activities that can benefit from practice over time. And thirdly, I've highlighted here understanding that mobile learning works best when you've thought about the physical and social environments that people are studying in. Things like, will there be free Wi-Fi? Can their devices be easily charged? Are they able to interact safely? And so on. As I am running out of time, I will just briefly mention uh, another piece of work uh, which was specifically done for teachers. So I think it's really important for me to mention it. This was a British Council funded project and we looked at English for second language and um, as a second language and for academic purposes. We worked with groups of learners in Brighton and their teachers. We looked at how they currently use mobile technologies to support their learning. Uh, so, for example, they do things like making recordings or making notes on their, on their phones, sharing them and so on. And on the basis of that information, as well as uh, research evidence, we produced a free guide for teachers called the Mobile Pedagogy for English Language Teaching Guide, which you can download from the British Council website. Um, so just type in Mobile Pedagogy for English Language Teaching into Google and you will find it. Um, and that guide um, explains what we mean by mobile tech pedagogy. It uh, gives examples of activities that you can try out and it gives a framework for rethinking your practice. And, and briefly, this is the diagram that summarizes uh, the framework. I don't have to, time to go through it now, but basically, just very briefly, at the center of it, you'll see a question. How does the activity exploit these aspects? And so how does the learning activity that you're designing for your learners exploit your wisdom as a teacher? So you've got these four quadrants, teacher wisdom, the device features, learner mobilities, and language dynamics. And so we go into the detail of what we mean by these different things. And, um, it's a kind of a first step, I think, uh, towards helping teachers design learning uh, that will take place either in the classroom, depending on how they run their classes, uh, or beyond. Uh, I suppose with the emphasis on beyond the classroom, but looping back into classroom activity very often to discuss uh, what's been done outside the class. Um, so, um, I hope many of you will download the guide and that we'll um, uh, get some feedback on whether you found it useful or not. Okay, thank you very much, thank Agnes. You. Thank you again. Thank you.